Good evening. Welcome again to another study in the Word of God from New Life Ministries Church. On behalf of the pastor and the membership, I come to you in the name of the Lord to share with you the thoughts that the Lord has placed on my heart that would encourage you and build you up so that you can walk in the fullness of the life that Jesus Christ has provided for us through his word and by his spirit. Before we go any further, let's go before the Lord in prayer and ask for his anointing. Father, we first of all confess that we love you and we thank you for all that you have done. We confess that without you we're nothing. We give all the glory, the honor, and the praise to you because you are worthy to receive all glory, all honor, and all praise. We were created by you and we were created for your pleasure. We were created to do your will and to fulfill your desire for our life because it is only in that that we truly find life. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, that we would have life and have it more abundantly. And we thank you for that. I ask as your humble servant that you would anoint these lips of clay that I would be an oracle of your word and of your will to your people and that they will walk up right before you and that the light that you've placed in us will so shine before men and women everywhere that they will see the good works and glorify you who are in heaven. We ask this in Jesus' sweet name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to go with me to um, the second epistle or letter of Peter to the church. Uh, we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, as you can see, our um, title today of our message is Let's Grow Up. I'm, uh, I'm no longer 19, and every day I'm reminded of that in some fashion or another. Uh, I can't go as fast as I used to go. I don't think as well as I used to think. And I can't lift what I used to lift. There are things that I just can't do. And I know some of you, you know, might have a problem with me confessing that. And it's not a deal of, of uh, a lack of faith or anything like that because I can do what I need to do. By the strength and by the help of the Lord, I'm able to do the things that I need to do. I just don't, because of my age now, I am not foolish enough to try to do what I did at 19 because I don't recover as quickly as I did at 19. Now, some of you might want to live in the fantasy land and go do that and whatever, help yourself. Uh, but I'm going to use some wisdom and do what I know I'm able to do. And that is reasonable. As the old folks, I used to hear them say this, and I didn't grasp it then, but I grasp it now. They used to say, we thank God for giving us a reasonable portion of good health. And that's what I can say. He has given me a reasonable portion of good health. I can eat what I pretty much want to eat. I can go where I want to go. I can do what I need to do. And so what more can you ask for? But let's grow up. And this is more from a standpoint of uh, mental and spiritual than it is from the physical and natural. I don't deal with the games as a youth that I used to, you know, some games we used to play as a youth. Uh, I don't do that anymore. Uh, you won't find me out uh, on my knees uh, pushing around a toy truck unless I'm down there with my grandson or my granddaughter and I'm playing with them and uh, entertaining them, I might get down and whatever and do those things. Um, but you won't find me doing as I was when I was their age. I don't do those things anymore because I don't play with those kind of toys uh, anymore. I got bigger toys to play with. But the thing is, is that uh, there are some things that we did as children that we don't do now as adults. As children, we depended upon our parents to feed us, to clothe us, to provide shelter for us. 
and in, in, in other words, to support us. Well, as we get older and we have children of our own, we should not be looking to our parents to continue to do those things. We should take responsibility as an adult and do the things that adults do. So I've, I've shared with you the natural side of things, the things that every uh, man and woman uh, go through. But let's look at it from a spiritual standpoint. From a spiritual standpoint, if you got saved 20 years, 30 years, 40 years ago, that should have been a change in you. If you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should not be stagnant. You should not be the same level that you were 20 and 30 years ago. There should be some growth. If there is no growth, it's because you have not accepted the Word of God and applied it to your life. You're still trying to operate in a spiritual realm from a natural standpoint, from a natural foundation, and it's not going to work. The natural man cannot understand spiritual things. The natural man is not subject to the spiritual things. It has to be the other way around. It has to, it has to be, I mean, matter of fact, it has to be, uh, you have to let go of the natural man. When I'm talking natural, I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about the carnal mind. The carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God. Romans 8 chapter tells us that. So therefore, we need to reject that carnal mind and embrace the spiritual mind. The spiritual mind is based upon the word of God, which comes from the mind of God. Now let's look at verse 14 of chapter 3 in 2 Peter. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. What things? Well, you can read the previous verses when he's talking about the life that is to come, the the new heavens and the new earth that is to come, that God has prepared for his people. So he said, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. Now this right here, looking forward, not looking back. Too often we're looking back at what we did, what we didn't do, what we could have, would have, should have, and all that stuff. That's in the past. I have a, a brother that often says, turn the page. It's a new page, new day. Bishop Craig Johnson would say that. Uh, new day, new page, turn it. So, Likewise, I say to you, look forward. Look forward to what God has prepared for us. And the things in the past are just that, in the past. Let them go. Leave them there in the past. If you got people that are still living in the past, talking about what, uh, what used to be, what you did years ago, whatever, leave them alone. Let them stay in the past. If they want to stay there, if they don't want to see the, the growth of the, of the Lord in your life, they don't want to see you progressing or whatever, don't waste time trying to make them see because it's not that important. What's important is for you to follow the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit and grow in grace. Let's read this. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot or blemish. That's what, your, that's what your focus should be. You should be focusing on trying to find that place in Christ where he will be pleased with you. Trying to find that place in Christ where you can work out the salvation that he has purchased for you. You can work it out in your life. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. Uh, the law, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. What does that mean? That means that there is a process and God is patient with us. God is patient and he is caring and he waits and he, he works with us. He understands us. He understands us better than we understand ourselves. And he has worked with us. So his, his long suffering is salvation to us. Because if he treated us the way we treat one another or the way we've treated other people and all, he would have cut us off a long time ago. When he had made things plain and straight to us and then we still were stubborn and, and hard-headed and disobedient and all, he had the right to cut us off, but he didn't do that. He was patient and kind and he brought us through with love, in love and kindness has he drawn us. 
And Paul wrote this and, and said this also. As also in all his letters, speaking in them about these things in which are some things hard to understand, which the unlearned and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. If somebody, I'm talking preachers and pastors, if you have folk that don't want to hear the word and whatever, don't lose sleep over it. Now, that may sound harsh and whatever, but there, there are a lot of people out there that want to know the truth. Focus on them. But folk who will just want to have their own way and won't listen to, to uh, any good teaching, any sound doctrine, you know, don't waste time. Pray for them, yes, but continue on. Press on. And don't let them upset your day. Keep your focus on the Lord. Turn them over to the Lord because, number one, pastors, they're not your sheep. They belong to the Lord. You're there to assist. You're there to do what the chief shepherd tells you to do. If you've done what the chief shepherd has told you to do, if you've fed them what the chief shepherd has told you to feed them, then you've done your job. Pray for them. Give them to the Lord who they belong to. And you press on with the next order of business. Let's grow up. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on guard, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being carried away by the error of the wicked. If you follow behind these folk that have already erred in their disobedience, they've already erred in their un, uh, not having faith, their lack of faith and all, be careful because you can get caught up in that same mess. And before you know it, you have lost your fellowship with the Lord. But grow in grace. Let's grow up. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, why would he say grow in grace? Grace is unmerited favor. In other words, uh, you grow in showing mercy and kindness even to those who don't deserve it. You still show them mercy. You still show kindness to them. That's growing in grace. And you also are growing in grace when you recognize your shortcomings and your faults and you confess those to the Lord. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't don't try to act like everything is all good and you got it all down pat and you've arrived when you know that you haven't. Be honest with God. Be honest with uh, when the Holy Spirit points out a fault or a shortcoming. Be honest to confess it and say, Lord, yes, I blew it. I messed up. Forgive me. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is how you learn about him. When you blow it and you go and you confess your sin and he forgives you and restores you and he takes that uh, particular struggle out of your way and all, you're learning about his power in your life. You're learning about his faithfulness in your life. You learn about who he is. You've read about what he, uh, who he is and what they have testified of, but then it becomes a reality in your life. So then you become a credible witness of who Jesus is. You become a credible witness of what Jesus can do. You become a credible witness of what he has given you. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. We're growing up. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to start at verse 11. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And I'm reading for you from, to you from the uh, Logos uh, translation. Uh, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Christ gave us these particular offices or gifts uh, that operate in those offices, uh, in those, those particular individuals that he has given to us uh, for the perfecting of the saints. Your pastors are there to perfect you. Your teaching elders are there to perfect you. The evangelist that comes around is there to perfect you. The prophet is there to perfect you, to help mature you. That's what it means, to help you grow up. The apostle is there to help you grow up. Now the apostle, 
the prophets and the evangelists, those are gifts to the overall body. They're not, they're not confined to one particular church. Whereas pastors and teachers are confined to individual churches. So if you have a church or an assembly, you might not have an apostle there. You might not have a prophet there. You might not have evangelists in your church, but you do have a pastor and a teacher in every assembly of the body of Christ. So let me put it this way. The pastors and teachers are local. The others can be regional, national, or international to the body of Christ. Until we all arrive, this verse 13, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Back to what Peter said. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So until we arrive, it's for the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until this is an ongoing process. It's not something that happened uh back in, in the first century A.D., and that's it. No, it is a continuing process until Christ returns, until we all arrive to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And there's a reason behind this. The purpose behind this is that we may no longer be infants. Let's grow up being tossed as by waves and being carried about by every wind of doctrine. There should be some stability in your spiritual life, in your spiritual walk. There should be some foundation there. There should be some things that are non-negotiable. You should be able to say, uh, okay, I'm open to this, open that, but not to this. This here, is, this here is foundational. And I'm not changing for anybody. Because this is what the Lord says we need to do and we need to and how we need to be. And you shouldn't change. In other words, let me put it like this. The word of God is given. And that should be set in our hearts and our minds. And we should never, ever move from what the word of God has stated. Don't try to water it down. Don't try to compromise with the world to try to get them to accept the word of God. Because if you compromise and it's watered down, it's not the word of God. It was not the word that came out of his mouth. It ceases to be the word of God. The scripture talks about the word of God as being pure water. Well, water that is mixed with anything is no longer pure. It's water, just like a word is a word, but it's no longer pure. And the word is no longer of God if it's mixed with something. We need to accept it just the way it is and be stable, established on that. That we may no longer, verse 14 again, that we may no longer be infants being tossed as by waves and being carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in regard to deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love. Now, this is the key about growing up. We may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ. The key ingredient, the essential ingredient in growing up, if you're going to grow up healthy spiritually, there must be love. Without love in in those in that uh, 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 nutrition in in, in that 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 uh, in the food that you receive that you're feeding, if love is not in there, you will not grow. It will stagnate you, because love cares. Love looks out for what is best for the receiver, not what's best to the giver. Love is looking at, at what is what the receiver needs. How is it going to bring fruit of that receiver? When you love, you are planting with hope that it will bring forth fruit unto the Lord Jesus Christ. But if it's not in love, then all you want to do is show off how much you know. Or you want to control everything. You want to be in control. You want to dictate to folks how they're supposed to do and whatever. It's all about you. So that's not love. And you can't grow up. 
Have you ever, when you were a child, when you were a kid, did you ever uh, get involved with some kids who every time you was going to play a game, they had to be the ones in charge of the game? It had to be the game they wanted to play. If they didn't want to play the game, they weren't playing. You ever been experienced that? I have. And unfortunately, I see that in the church. If it's not part of the way I want it to be, then I'm not going to participate. You're not growing up. You're acting childish. Let me read that again, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the working of the measure of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the edification of itself in love. In other words, everybody should stay in their own lane in other words, the lane that the Holy Spirit has placed you in the body of Christ. Grow there. Be nourished there. Don't try to, if, if, if God has placed you in the hand of the body of Christ, don't try to be the foot. Be the hand. God has placed you as an ear in the body of Christ. Don't try to be the eye. Be the ear. Be what God has, has called you to be. And at the same time, don't try to tell other folk where they're supposed to be. You do what God called you to do. And let the Holy Spirit do his job. Because he knows how the body is supposed to be. You don't. According to the working of the measure of each individual part, causes the growth of the body, let's grow up, for the edification, the building up of itself in love. There's that word love. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to start at verse 1, showing you how to grow up. As I said before, before we get into this, as I said before, and I'm, there's something I'm noticing. I, I don't have the, I don't have the tolerance, and I don't have the energy to play games anymore. Don't play. I, I don't play games with you. When I minister through this uh, medium or uh, any other medium, when I minister. Whether it's one on one or whether it's in a setting like this and all, I'm not playing games. I'm giving to you what I believe God has given me to give to you, and that's it. But likewise, since I don't play games with you, don't try to play games with me. Husbands, stop playing games in your marriage. Wives, stop playing these games in your marriage. Parents, stop playing games with the children. Trying to control and manipulate and whatever. That's, that's foolishness. That's childish. You get upset because something doesn't go your way. Where's the love? Love will help you find a better way of communicating. And there are times that you need to keep your mouth shut. You know, there's an old adage that says, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Sometimes, most of, the, most of the time, that is true. That is the best course of action. But some people won't let you to keep your mouth. Some people push you until you tell them just what you're feeling, and then they get offended because you told them what you were feeling. And they kept saying, I want to know. And you tell them, and then they don't want to know. Games. That's not growing up. That's staying stagnant and staying a child. 1 Corinthians 13 and 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. That's the essential ingredient. I have become a sounding brass or a clashing cymbal. In other words, it's a lot of noise. When I was growing up, we said there was another way that they... 
They say they say you're talking loud and saying nothing. So you're making a lot of noise. But you're not making a lot of sense. That's the gist of it. And though I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. In other words, even though I might have all the gifts of the spirit that I can do miracles, I can do all these things and whatever, these, these showcase of gifts, uh, what a spotlight is on me and whatever, even though I have all those things, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. So turn your focus, your ambitions away from the things that you can get and put your focus and ambition on receiving God's love and of channeling that love to others. This world needs love. I'm not talking about the love that Hollywood produces. I'm not talking about Hollywood love. I'm talking about the love of God, agape love. That's what that's that's the Greek word that's used here about love is agape love. And and the best translation, even though I'm not reading the translation uh, here, but the best best translation that, that that fits it to me personally is the King James version. It says uh, charity. It calls it charity. It doesn't say love. It says charity. And charity is a, a love or a way of giving, not expecting anything in return. So that's perfect. When you love, not expecting anything in return, that's pure love. That's true love. Because all other love is done with an expectation of return. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever. In other words, whether you accepted him or not, God still gave him. Whether you received him or not, God still gave him. Because he so loved. And that's what you do if you're really operating from love. I dare say this, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll ask the old children, uh, do you love mama? Do you love papa? And whatever. To be honest with you, that baby doesn't know really what love is. They know how to respond to true love. When you give love to them, they respond. They, they, they embrace it. They entrust it. They began to depend upon it. But they, if you ask them what it really is, they couldn't really tell you. So they really don't have a, a conception of what, a concept of what true love is. But as they grow older and they mature, as they grow up, then they're in a position to understand what true love is. That's why babies don't get married because they're not mature enough. They're not mature physically. They're not mature emotionally. They're not mature spiritually. They're not mature psychologically. There has to come, there's a point in the process of growing up that they began to obtain those uh, places of, mat of maturity where they, where they can love. They can reciprocate love. Verse 3, and though I give away all my possessions to feed the poor, and though I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. There are people that will sacrifice everything they have, but it's really not love. Love is not, that, that, that's, that does not prove love. You can sacrifice everything else from another motivation. From another motive, you can, you can sacrifice, you can, you can give your body to be burned because you want to make a statement. It's not out of love. And if you do that and it's not out of love, look at this. It profits me nothing. But look at what love is. True love is. Love is patient. If you don't have patience, you're not operating in love. Love is kind. If you're not kind to folks, you don't have any empathy with people and sympathy with people. You don't have true love. Love does not envy. If you if you are intimidated by someone else's gifts or someone else's abilities, 
and all, and, and, and when they're going forth and they're sharing or they're doing and whatever, and you feel like you got to get into it in order to um, uh, feel like you're worth something or whatever, that's not love. When you're envying, you're jealous of someone else, that's not love. Love does not boast, it's not arrogant. You ever been around somebody that uh, you say something that you did? Well, they did it, but they did it bigger. You bought something. Well, they bought the same thing, but they bought more of it. You said something that was, was awesome. But they also said something that was just mind-bending. You ever been around folk like that? That's not what true love is. It doesn't boast. And it's not arrogant. Does not behave itself, does not behave disgracefully. Does not seek its own. Oh, my word. Does not seek its own. Doesn't try to protect itself. When Christ was on the cross, he didn't try to protect himself. He had 12 legions of angels that could have protected him. All he had to do was just really think it. But he said, with well, just one request from his father, he'd have it. But he didn't because he loved us so much that he died for us. Doesn't seek his own. He saw what we needed. Did you know he didn't need anything? He was set. He didn't need anything. Read Psalm 16 when he talks about his goodness. He says, my goodness extendeth not unto thee, talking about to the Father, but it's to the brothers that are in the earth, to us. The righteousness of Christ did not add anything to God's righteousness or his holiness, but his righteousness was given to us for our righteousness. Because our right, our, our self-producing righteousness is, is as filthy rags. But his righteousness is what the Father will accept and recognize. He is not provoked to anger, thinks no evil. We need to pause before you say things. Ask yourself, do I always look at what's wrong or am I more often looking at what's right? Do I always think negative or do I more often think what is positive? Do I seek the positive? There used to be an old saying about uh, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, and don't mess with Mr. In-Between. Do you do that? Do I do that? We should ask ourselves that question. Uh, thinks no evil. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. You don't feel good when somebody is doing wrong or when somebody has been busted being wrong. You don't feel good. You don't rejoice in that. You should rejoice more in somebody doing what is right. You should rejoice more in someone uh, standing up for what is right, someone that is doing what is right, and someone that is speaking the truth. You should be seeking the truth. If you are of God, you should seek the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But if you're not seeking the truth, then Jesus said it this way. He said, the devil, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar from the beginning. He's the father of lies. So if you are promoting or you following after, or you're accepting that which is not true, and that's what you're embracing, you're embracing a product of the devil. You're not embracing what is of God. You need to grow up. Bears all things. Oh, man, we can't take anything. We can't handle anything. We get offended at everything. Believes all things. You should give folks the benefit of a doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt. If they're, if, if they're not on the up and up, if they're not being true, it'll come out. But don't automatically rush to judgment. Hopes all things. 
endures all things. This is what love would do. This is what growing up is. This is what this is being the adult in the room. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they shall pass away. Whether there are tongues, they shall cease. Whether there is knowledge, it shall pass away. Go to the cemetery. We got a lot of uh, physicists and uh, rocket scientists that's laid up in there. It's gone. Their, their knowledge is gone. In other words, you can't get anything from them anymore. Great as they were when they, when they were here, they're gone now. So you can't get anything from them. And tongues, there are a lot of languages that no longer exist. Latin is one of them. It's no longer it's called a living language. Yes, it's spoken in some quarters of the Roman Catholic Church. And we used to have it in, uh, in high school. I don't even know if they even offer it anymore. So much has changed since I was a, a teenager. But they shall cease. Prophecies, they shall pass away. In other words, prophets come and prophets go. Now we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is partial shall pass away. Now, you've got various commentators that have dealt with this. Some say that meant that when the, uh, the canon of the accepted books of the New Testament were uh, codified or, or put together into one book, the New Testament, uh, and became a part of the Bible, then we didn't need any more prophecies. We didn't need any more tongues. Uh, well, do we need any more knowledge? We need all of those things. They have those. Th that's not what this is talking about. I just showed you what it's talking about, that of what can pass away and everything. However, uh, this here says, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is partial shall pass away. What is that which is perfect shall come? When Christ comes. When we, uh, I just read to you in Ephesians, Till we all come together in the unity of the faith. And that's when we will come together in the unity of faith. When we stand before Christ, there won't be Baptist. There won't be Pentecostal. There won't be Lutheran. There won't be Catholic. There won't be Methodist. And so on and so forth. There won't be any of these denominations. When we stand before Christ, it will be one man, one body in Christ. Won't be Jew or Gentile. He's made of, of two into one man. Then verse 11, as we can see right there next to me. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. I reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, I put away the things of the child. When I became a man, I put my marbles up. When I became a man or a woman, when I became an adult, got rid of the jacks, don't play hopscotch anymore. Those things were good at their time and in their place, but I don't have to deal with that anymore. It's time for us saints to grow up. Stop trying to find fault with one another in the church but start trying to find what's right with one another in the church. Stop trying to divide and start trying to unify. And, and let me tell you something. If you let politics divide you, you don't have much faith. You don't. If you're letting um, uh, color divide you, you don't have much faith. If you're letting... Uh, Science, uh, 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 what I want to say, the uh, financial uh, situations divide you, the haves and the have not. You don't have much faith because you look at the wrong thing. You're not looking at Christ. If you were to see Christ, you would see that we all are rich. More than what any money could buy. Verse 12, for now we see through a mirror by reflection, but then face to face. 
Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. How do I know as I am known? The more that you allow the love of God to flow through you, the more you will begin to understand the mind of God and his desires and what he wants done the more you begin to understand those things and you'll be able to accomplish it because his love is flowing through you. And now abide it, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's grow up. Let's grow up so that we can truly love each other but love God and God can love each other through us. And thereby he is glorified, he is praised, and he is honored. Put the games up. And let's get up and get about our Father's business. Father, help us to mature in you and in Christ Jesus so that we may bear good fruit unto you in your kingdom and that you might be pleased in all that we do we love you we bless you we praise you we thank you father thank you so much we love you so much we ask this in jesus name amen and amen god bless you saints until next time go with god via gandias